So we read the story of Oedipus. And Oedipus comes to the Sphinx right outside of Thebes. And the Sphinx has the famous riddle, what walks on four legs in the morning and two legs at noon and three legs in the afternoon. And this, this riddle has befuddled everybody. And if you could not answer the Sphinx's riddle, the Sphinx would eat you. So the, here is Oedipus and he has to answer this riddle. And he does. You remember the answer? Man. Man walks on four legs as a baby, two legs as an adult, and three legs, we're using a cane or a staff or something, when he is old. And the Sphinx destroys itself and Oedipus is able to continue his journey. And, and we, we're amazed, or supposed to be amazed at how smart Oedipus is and how wise he is because he's the one guy that can answer this riddle. And even now, you'll be given tests. Can you figure out riddles? That's a sign of intelligence. Can you, can you figure the subtleties of the words? Can you pay attention to the nuances? And personally, I hate riddles. If you have something to tell me, tell me. Don't, don't say, what does, I don't want to know all of that. I want to know what you got to tell me because I'm busy, you're busy. Let's get to the chase and let's move on. Can you imagine what kind of disciple I would have been? I, I would have been the ones going, you constantly talk with parables. Now, I'd probably been behind. Go, go tell him, Simon Peter. Get up there and tell him. Ask him why he won't explain stuff. Because Jesus taught in parables. Stories that walk alongside life. Stories that are like, give us word pictures, insight, that constantly make us think because each time we read them, we are a different person. A father had two sons. And we read that as a young person and with a young, and with a young son who took the resources and the wealth of the father and squandered them in foolish living. Read the story again. And you're the older brother who was lost even though he stayed home. Read it again. And you're the father who waits. Same story. Lots of truth, all in one little short story that Jesus gave us. So maybe Jesus is telling us what we want to know. Maybe he is answering our questions. Maybe he is giving it to us in a way we can understand because all of the parables are very simple. The kingdom of God is like. Perhaps the problem is not in Jesus' telling, but in our listening how many times does Jesus say, let the one who has ears, let him hear? Maybe it's not with Jesus' words, but with our ears. So as we start this series of the parables of the kingdom of God, let us pray for healing of our hearing. Let's stand now as we begin and we'll read the story of the seed that grows secretly. It's found in Mark chapter 4, verse 26. Hear now the word of the Lord. The kingdom of God is like this. A man scatters seed on the ground. He sleeps and he rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows and he doesn't know how. The soil produces a crop by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the ripe grain on the head. As soon as the crop is ready, he sends for the sickle because the harvest has come. The kingdom of God is like this. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Teach us now what the kingdom of God is like that we in obedience and great joy may, like the man in the story, cast this life-changing seed of the kingdom wherever we get the chance. And we pray this in your name, amen. What's the first thing you think about when you read the story? You know, I read this story and I, the first thing I think about is what a lazy farmer. Now, I don't know anything about farming. 
But I've been around farmers enough to know that that's not the way you plant seed. You don't walk through the field, grab a handful, and just throw it to wherever it lands. It lands and just trust that it's going to do what it does. There's an entire process of dirtology. Oh, no, if you're going to be a farmer, you've got to be a serious student of dirt. Uh, we have the plots behind, uh, uh, out, out on the, the fields behind our church and at the end of the parking lot back there. And we, we have subdivided these plots, and, and several of you are part of that, growing uh, uh, vegetables and uh, having little garden plots. And we, it's a lot of fun because we've got senior adults that are teaching new skills and how to garden to, to young families, and it's a lot of fun back there. But, but a few weeks ago, a few of them were out there, and I stopped, and, and they were all excited because we had turned the dirt. Uh, it was a big day. I thought they were going to have a parade. I didn't know. Okay, now I didn't, I didn't let on like, I don't know what turning dirt means. I didn't know you could turn dirt. But according to them, they were really excited because it was the first time that the plow had turned the dirt, kind of taken that first la layer and opened it up. And there was something about the way that the air and that first layer of dirt interacted, it got the dirt ready. The first thing you have to do is prepare the soil. You have to be a serious student of dirt if you're going to be a decent farmer. This farmer's not. The kingdom of God is like a man who throws seed. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't do anything else. He doesn't water. Like I say, I don't know much about farming, but, but we got a couple of potty plants, and Junie says I have to water them all the time. This farmer doesn't do that. He doesn't fertilize anything. He doesn't weed it. He doesn't go out there and check it. He just kind of waits. What a lazy farmer to have any kind of harvest, much less one that's going to require the kind of work that he sends for, send for the sickle because the harvest is ready. And the implication here is there's a lot of harvest and there's a lot of work. And you want to know, how in the world does this lazy farmer get away with this? All right, hold it right there. Stop right there because this is good news for you and me. If you're going to be a serious sower of the seed of the kingdom, you don't have to be a real good farmer. You don't have to be a great theologian. You don't have to be a great teacher. You don't have to be a great anything. You just have to be willing to throw the seed every time you see a little patch of dirt. That's it. That's the one qualification. Do you have the ability to grab the seed and throw it? You're hired. You don't have to be brilliant. All of us think, well, I'll get serious about the gospel and when I learn more. I'll get serious about sharing my faith once I understand it. I'll get serious about doing this or doing that once I can, you know, the old southern, we're fixing to get ready. We're never ready. We're always fixing to. And a lot of us think, as soon as I have things set up, I, I want to become a friend with my neighbor first. I, I, the guy who works with me in the office who doesn't know Christ, I want to establish a relationship first. We want to do all of this dirtology stuff for evangelism. And, the, and Jesus says the kingdom of God isn't like that at all. The kingdom of God is like a farmer who throws the seed out. You don't have to be real good. You do have to throw it out. But you don't have to be real good. You do have to trust the seed. And what an amazing thing this seed is. Uh, like I said, I don't know anything about farming, but I did plant a butter bean in a milk carton once. <laughs> and every day we would stare at the dirt wondering why there wasn't a butter bean plant because we were going to be graded about whether or not that plant came up. And you didn't know, did you have to yell at it? Did you have to wake it up? What did you have to do? No, the butter bean knew what to do when it was covered with dirt. There was something about the way that God made a butter bean that when you put dirt on top of it, the butter bean said, oh, must be time to grow. Must be time to make another butter bean plant so we can have more butter beans than just me. The butter bean knew to do that. You didn't have to explain it to the butter bean. You didn't have to send it to class. It just knew. You don't have to tell the seed what to do. 
You don't have to motivate the seed. You don't have to go out and yell at your plants. You don't have to bry them. They are given that DNA that when they are put in certain situations, they will know to sprout. When they're put in certain situations, they will know to grow, and they will grow through anything. Some of us have grass growing in the middle of our driveways. We didn't plant it, any grass in the middle of our driveway. But when we paved over that little piece of dirt, there was grass seed in that dirt. And that grass seed knew to grow. And it knew if we can push hard enough through this concrete, we'll be able to find light. If we can push hard enough through this concrete, we'll be able to find water. If we can just get a chance, we'll find a way to live. That's the way the, le the, the seed is put together. If you'll give the seed half a chance, the seed will learn how to grow. It will do it all by itself. You don't have to teach it, train it. It just shows up and it knows how to do that. The work of the kingdom is done by the Spirit of Jesus, not by you, not by me. It, we're, not, we're not in charge of convicting anybody. We're not in charge of changing anybody's mind. We're told to show up and be a witness. You can only be a witness of what you know. Were you there? Did you see? Were you part of it? Yes. Let me tell you who Jesus is to me. Let me tell you what I've learned about Jesus. Let me tell you how Jesus has worked in my own life. That's all you have to do. Trust Jesus to know how to work his own seed. And when you plant seed, it disappears. And a lot of us are very impatient. Well, I told two or three people nothing happened. It won't. It takes a little while. So you plant the seed and you wait. You answer the question and you wait. You pray and you wait. You get up, go about your day, and you go to sleep at night. But you trust the seed to do what the seed will do. You do trust the seed, don't you? You do trust the seed, don't you? You do know in the way that you need to know and the way that is truth for you. You do know, I, I, and what I mean by that, you know in your head, yes, I have the information, but you know in that you have tested it in your own life. So you know it to be true because I've tried it out. I have proven this in my own living. You do know to trust the seed, don't you? Ah, uh, that's where it gets a little tougher, doesn't it? Because we haven't trusted the seed in our own life. It's not that we have thrown the seed and it has failed. We have looked at the circumstances of our life. We've looked at the situations and said, this one is too tough. And we've never planted the seed at all. We have an addiction. We have a, 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 a serial sin that is, 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 is kind of our own little private and nobody's being hurt because nobody knows about it. Uh, and, and so we, we, we kind of push it off to the side, but we, we say to Jesus, this is off limits. You can't do anything because I can't fix this. I, I, I can't break away from it. Uh, may, maybe there's a, a struggle with anger or, or your temper or, or this or that. Just, just, just pick your sin of choice. And, and you say to you, say, you know, I'm doing okay, but, but the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ is life, death, and resurrection can't really change anything about that. And you don't even bother to plant the seed. You know, the story starts when the seed is planted. Poor Jack sells the family cow for a handful of seeds, comes home and shows his mother about the magic seeds. The mother is so mad. She throws the seed out the window, and it is there that the story starts. But you have to put it in the dirt before it ever do anything. The seed in your hand doesn't do anything. The seed in your pocket 
doesn't do anything. The seed on the shelf doesn't do anything. You have to put it in the dirt before it will do anything. And when you do, it will do its work. Do you know the first sign that naturalists look for before, if they can tell if a region is going to recover, if there's been some kind of damage from a storm or a fire, you know the first thing they look for? Grass. Grass. Is grass growing again? If grass is growing again, that's the first sign that the, that the land is going to be able to restore itself, heal itself because of the grass. We look at areas of our own lives and they're barren and devastated and we do not think that anything can change it so we ignore it and it continues to erode in the storms of life because we won't ever trust the seed to plant, to throw it on there at all. We turn on the television and we see story after stories of, of pain and brokenness and confusion and devastation and we say that Jesus can't do anything there so we don't even bother to plant the seed do you remember the old poem by Carl Sandburg I had to memorize that like eighth grade do you remember how it goes pile the bodies high at Austerlitz in Waterloo Pile them high, shovel them under, and let me work. I am the grass. I cover all. Pile them high at Gettysburg. Pile them high at Yapri and Verdun. Shovel them under and let me work. Two years, ten years. Passengers will ask a conductor. What place is this? Where are we now? Cover them up. Let me work. I am the grass. I cover all. So you have that spot of barrenness and brokenness in your own life. Nothing good can happen here, you say. Nothing will ever change. Throw the seed. It is the kingdom of God. It covers all. Let it work. You have a relationship that you don't think will ever be restored. Throw the seed. Let it work. It covers all. We have a world that seems to be hell-bent on self-destruction, and we don't think that the good news of Jesus can change any of that. Sow the seed. Let it work. It covers all. Our world is barren and dry, not because the plants didn't grow, but because the seed was never planted. The kingdom of God is like a man who threw his seed. 